If you grew up in the 90s, you're probably familiar with collectible trading card games like Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, or Magic the Gathering. You either participated in them yourself, or you probably knew somebody else who did. And for good reason. These games have been around for decades, and each with great levels of success. Magic the Gathering reportedly generates over $300 million in annual revenue, the Pokemon company turns over 2 billion Pokemon cards per year, and Konami has sold over 25 billion Yu-Gi-Oh cards. In fact, according to a study in 2017, over 9.1 million people actively play or trade with some type of collectible trading card. So as you can probably tell, this is no small niche. Trading cards have become a worldwide phenomenon, but the question that I want to answer in today's video is why? What is it about these cardboard rectangles with pretty pictures and maybe a little bit of foiling that attracts so many people to spend so much money and time on them? Well, after a bit of research and consideration, along with playing Yu-Gi-Oh! myself for nearly 20 years, I think I've boiled down seven main reasons why people like trading card games so much. At the core of every one of these trading card games is the collectible aspect. Cards typically come in a tiered rarity system that makes some cards just more desirable than others. Even the same card just in a non-foil rarity. But not every card game player wants to amass a huge collection of rare cards. Some people are only looking for very specific cards and they want to trade, buy, or sell in order to get those. Trading, as you guys know, is the act of two people exchanging cards of the same perceived value. But sometimes, cards aren't actually traded for other cards at all. With the blooming popularity of trading card games, some cards are simply worth so much that it's not practical or feasible to trade other cards for them. So how do we fix this? With the great equalizer itself and the root of all evil, money. Well-known websites like eBay and Amazon, as well as specialty websites like TCG Player, allow us to place cash values on trading cards, and it's where the majority of trading takes place nowadays. What this creates are two different types of collectors. There are collectors who keep cards with the intention of holding onto them potentially forever. There are also collectors who get cards with the intention of letting them sit and accrue values that they can then trade or sell them away later for a profit. These people are often called vendors, and they're not at all uncommon in the community. People who buy and sell cards on the daily at events, local card shops, that sort of thing. There are even legendary cards worth tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. For example, in Magic the Gathering, there's the infamous Black Lotus, a card that's been long since banned from play, but is worth over $20,000 and is seen as a sort of status symbol within the community. A lot like the thrill of throwing all of your money into a slot machine and hoping to see sevens line up, trading card games also have their own sort of lottery system. I like to think the most accurate comparison to gambling in card games is the famous Japanese gotcha system, where you put your money into a small machine and a random prize comes out. This same system has seen loads of success in the mobile gaming world, and it's not very different in trading card games. In fact, it's the basis for how booster packs tend to work. A typical booster pack might cost three to four dollars and contain anywhere from nine to 11 cards per pack. You're guaranteed common cards and maybe some uncommon cards, but getting the rare cards is elusive and difficult and thus requires you to purchase more and more packs in the hopes of finally getting a card that you want or at least a card that's more valuable than what you paid. This gotcha system relies on creating an expectation for a rare or flashy item and the dopamine hit that you get when you finally pull a rare prize. Even if the prize that you get isn't the one that you wanted, it's the idea that it could have been and the fact that you can try again which is usually more than enough to keep people buying. Even if you're not very familiar with trading card games, you've probably seen a Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh booster pack in a bookstore, a grocery store, a department store, or even a pharmacy. For some competitive-minded players, the idea of having to go and purchase packs and hope to pull the cards you want seems tedious, but for more casual players or newer players, the rush is a lot of fun. And no matter what, Getting the cards means that you are going to spend some amount of money, which makes booster packs a staple of all trading card games. For most people, the feeling of stopping by Walmart or Target or your local game store after school or work and just spending a couple of dollars to pick up one or two packs and see what you pull can be a really fun rush and it's especially exciting when you just randomly get a card that you weren't expecting, especially if it ends up being really valuable. Card games are a little bit different than other competitive games like a fighting game or a shooter. 
In card games, we'll get some basic guidelines like how many cards we can play at most in our deck or maybe a few cards that you can only use certain numbers of copies of. But for the most part, you kind of just get free reign over the cards and strategies that you use. From the outside looking in, it might seem a little bit weird to compare a trading card game to a fighting game, but it actually makes a little bit of sense if you think of a fighting game character's kit as a deck of cards that's a little bit randomized each time you play them. I'll get a little bit more of that in a second, but in terms of customization, I would say that trading card games have fighting games beat. Unlike other games where customization might just be limited to a skin or a playstyle, in trading card games you get 40 to 60 cards that you completely get to decide on. And that's not even including cosmetic options for things like sleeves, deck boxes, and playmats. The best way to describe it is if you were playing Street Fighter and you were able to choose what techniques where you could perform, changing his normal and special attacks into exactly the moves that you like. This depth of customization lets us form our own sense of identity with our trading card decks, and it usually enables quirky tech card choices and unique strategies that might go against the grain of the existing competitive field. So we all know that games are a lot of fun, but we don't go committing hundreds and hundreds of hours into playing them just for fun. More times than not, we fall in love with the strategic elements of a game and the way that those factor into how you win. For some people, it's as simple as the strategy that their deck uses to reach its win condition. For many others, strategy includes the in-game and even the physiological elements that you can use to predict what your opponent will do next. Taken a bit further, trading card games allow you to bluff and cause your opponent to make mistakes that might end up costing them the game. For this reason, it's oftentimes the strategies that aren't written directly on the cards themselves that provide the most gratifying feeling of satisfaction for players when they win. You can always win a game through reaching your deck's prescribed win condition, but reaching victory by bluffing your opponent or outplaying them just makes the victory feel that much sweeter. It might be a bit of a stretch to say, but in terms of strategy, you can compare a lot of card games to chess, with your deck's win condition being checkmate and each card that you play basically being a piece on the board. So I previously compared trading card games and fighting games, and I feel that the similarities become a lot more pronounced when you start talking about competition. Card games are typically played at a few different levels of competition. There's the super casual level where you're just starting out and playing with a small group of friends. There's the casual and semi-competitive level at your local card shop, for instance. And then finally, there's the competitive level, where you start competing at regional, national, or even international events with some of the best players from around the world. Like any other competitive game, card games oftentimes will have what's called a metagame. That's to say, certain strategies and card choices will be more successful and thus become more popular with players while less popular, more niche strategies eventually fall to the bottom. Truly adept players can level what they know about the metagame to utilize different tech cards and make unexpected strategies and decisions that blindside their competition. A lot of people like to think that trading card games can't possibly be competitive because of the luck elements that are existing in these games, but it's a rare occurrence when a less prepared player can beat a more prepared player in a full tournament match. And believe me when I say, prevailing in a tournament feels amazing regardless of what game you're playing. Contrary to what the memes might tell you, trading card games are actually an excellent source of face-to-face -face interaction. Unlike most video games where there's really only a voice or a text chat to communicate with other players, card games, at least in real life, have to be played with a physical opponent. Because of this social style of gameplay, many of us end up making plenty of friends while we play trading card games some of whom we might end up traveling to events with, and we might end up competing with people that we would have never met otherwise. Granted, this might have changed a little bit with the release of things like Hearthstone or even Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, but the basic principles still apply. In fact, for many people, weekly meetups at local card shops or libraries are just a regular part of their routine. Perhaps this is a bit on the darker side, but you could say that trading card games provide an avenue for socialization that many people just wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And last but not least, trading card games are just fun. Players get to form a deep and personal connection with the cards that they play. Along the way, you'll learn plenty of life lessons, you'll suffer some painful defeats, and you'll get to grow as a person. I almost feel like playing trading card games is sort of like a journey. You start off as a casual newbie who's just getting their feet wet in the game, and by the end of your journey, you're a seasoned veteran who's able to teach others how to play the game. 
Of course we wouldn't do anything if it wasn't fun, but it's great that games like Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, and plenty of others offer a truly unique experience that's just not quite like playing any other game. This video was sponsored by Yu-Gi-Oh! Red. Yu-Gi-Oh! Red is a website that makes deck building a cinch. You can find virtually any deck you're looking to build, and that even includes the latest deck lists from tournaments. It's never been easier to take a deck file from Yu-Gi-Oh! Pro or Dueling Book straight to real life. Yu-Gi-Oh! Red's importing and exporting features, combined with its always updating card prices, makes it one of the most reliable resources for deck builders. It has a smooth and easy to use interface that almost seems like it would be great as a mobile app. It's available on both iOS and Android. Check out the links in the video description for more information. And that's the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed and learned a thing or two about trading card games and why they're so popular. Maybe you'll even consider picking one up for yourself. Anyways, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to give the video a like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Pass turn.